Thank you, Jilly, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's also nice to be in this setting. I see quite a number of faces I know, and this is also part of these events. It's nice to catch up with a number of, uh, of people. Um, this by way of introduction, normally I have a nice joke or anecdote, but uh, these days, you know, we're a little bit more serene and uh, we do business uh, as usual. So, um, the subject is of course extremely challenging and uh, it could even be academic, uh, if you like, uh, the rights and obligations of, uh, or responsibilities of shareholders. But I, I think I will limit myself to share with you uh, this morning what is currently on the table in the Commission and do a short tour de table on the issues, the regulatory issues, um, as, I, as I see them. Um, put this a bit up, otherwise stand down all the time. Uh, the Shareholder Rights uh, Directive, you mentioned it already, Jilly. It's uh, already quite some time on the negotiation. If it would have been up to me, uh, we would have already have uh, wrapped it up. And I think that would have been feasible. Um, the underlying objective is, of course, to increase uh, transparency, in particular in the investment chain, and to set out a better framework uh, for more engagement between the companies and their shareholders. Um, I think we should never forget that the directive was a concrete follow-up from the financial crisis. Uh, the Commission has done green two green papers in this area, and, and this was supposed to be one of the replies to the short-termism of the markets that drove uh, our economies down in 2007, 2008. People forget this uh, sometimes. The directive focused to a very large extent on large shareholders, the big institutional investors. Does it mean that the small investors like you and me, not me then, are not important? Um, but influencing large institutional investors has of course a bigger, is likely to have a bigger impact. Um, so this underlying objective of the shareholder right directive is to foster more long-term oriented capital markets. And um, our assessment underpinned by a lot of evidence and a lot of study was that shareholders and directors need to consider more the long-term uh, consequences of their actions. And I think this is still um, d'actualité. Uh, if you look at recent events in uh, AGMs, uh, I think that has clearly confirmed that there's still an enormous need for better oversight on director's pay. Um, there has almost been again a shareholder spring uh, this year. Uh, Volkswagen, Deutsche Bank, BP, uh, Renault, Peugeot, but um, one of my colleagues made a list, it was uh, in incredibly long, where shareholders basically said we don't agree with the way the whole remuneration package has been constructed or what is going to be paid out. Now, the Shareholder Rights Directive tries to, to address this, so it's a bit a pity that we're not there yet, but this has to do with the overall process. The Directive is at the moment already subject to trialogues um, in, the, in the Commission, the Council, and the Parliament. But, as I think most of you know, the Parliament has introduced an amendment last year on country-by-country country reporting, a very important <coughs> issue on its own, and the Commission has worked intensively on an impact assessment on that issue. It came on the 12th of April with a proposal to um, modify or amend the accounting directive because it's a disclosure issue. That is now on the table. In the Council, work is, is uh, intensively taking place, and we hope now that this will lead to a decoupling of the shareholder rights directive and the country-by-country country reporting discussions. We're not there yet. The Parliament is, of course, still attached to its own amendment, but I think uh, the more time will pass, the more the two tracks will take their own way, and hopefully they come together at the end. Now back to the shareholder rights directive. A uh, lot of, you tell me when I have to stop, eh? because I'm it's Dutch, okay. but I like to talk still. It's very, very, very <laughs> non-Dutch. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of fins now in my DG, and fins are even more <laughs> shorter, but... Uh, <laughs> a lot of technical work has already been done, actually, in the Shadow Rights Directive. A bit invisible sometimes, but important issues like the scope, like definition, identification of shareholders, uh, I hope nobody will ask me questions because it's very technical, have already been dealt with. So all this technical work is there, but the more political things are still on the table, not that many as a matter of fact. So I think if people want and focus, it can be wrapped up um, rather quickly. To start with the remuneration chapter, is always a, a nice uh, thing. The original setup of the directive is still there. Companies are obliged to have a remuneration policy, 
uh, for a couple of years. And at the end, of every year, there will be a remuneration report. Um, this is something which you see already in quite a number of member states. And uh, to say this, I think the UK has been leading in this debate. And I think we should say that. Uh, the UK has been an, a front runner, an, an intelligent uh, developer of new concepts. And um, the, the FRC, uh, codes of conduct, all these things have been very early been set up already in the UK. And we have been inspired. It doesn't mean that the directive is cut and paste from what happens in the UK, but the concepts are there. Now, there's still a number of difficult issues to be addressed. Um, for instance, if you have a report, a policy, and you map out what can or should be paid out to the top management, how and to what extent can a company make an exception to that, or to an established policy, and pay out more than was initially intended? And if you do so, uh, why? And can certain safeguards be built in? This sounds a little bit dry, but you understand in reality it's quite, quite important. Another issue is, should there be in the policy an indication of the maximum amounts that can be paid out? Many shareholders would like to know, what am I signing up to? Uh, what is actually behind all these difficult formulas? What will happen? On the other hand, you have the risk of a race to the, a race to the top. Uh, once this is transparent, everybody wants to meet the, the threshold, and if not, there's a problem. Uh, th there are more things like variable remuneration. Um, do you limit this, and how do you limit this? What kind of instruments uh, should be used? Could you, as a wish, I think, in certain parts of the parliament, limit variable remuneration uh, when shares are used uh, in that context? Now, so there's a lot going on. Same about the report, um, which should, of course, be a kind of accountability um, uh, testimony. What happened? The content is, of course, very important. Uh, what were the components of remuneration? How were the performance, performance criteria applied? We come back to this, financial, non-financial indicators. <coughs> I think it's fair to say that this issue requires still some discussion and, and political, political decision making. It's not only technical, of course. Uh, one question is, at the end of the day, the vote in the AGM, should there always be a vote? If it is a vote, should it be an advisory vote or a binding vote? These kind of things are, are still not really fixed. That's for remuneration. <coughs> Second chapter, which is very important and when you speak about rights and responsibility, is the engagement policy uh, chapter. Uh, chapter 1B, for those that follow this more closely. Um, it's still open for further discussions and it deals basically with the transparency requirements for institutional investors, asset managers, proxy advisors, in short, everybody in the chain. And the general idea is that the institutional investors, so the big pension funds, the big insurance companies, um, and their asset managers shall develop a policy on shareholder engagement to set out how they will monitor the investments they make in companies. Because we all know the big pension funds do not invest always themselves, they use an asset manager. And in the chain, this is a little bit complex. So what kind of criteria are used, what kind of non-financial indicators, ESG-related issues are being considered. This is, again, um, also something which is reflected in the UK um, stewardship code. <coughs> it's all done, by the way, on a comply or explain basis. Um, I'll try to be a bit short, Jilly, because you see your strong zooming eyes. What, how long is he going to talk? <laughs> I think the, the basic bottom line here is to have transparency in the chain because we know there's a non-alignment of incentives. Um, I as an investor want to invest in a long time because in 20 years um, the people that are entitled will go on pension. In the chain people have maybe more short-term incentive to buy and sell. So how do you align this? How do you get this straight? Very briefly, on another consultation uh, we have done, which has been closed uh, this spring, is on ESG. Uh, it's very much linked to the rights and the role of shareholders. Um, and it, we try to get a clearer picture of uh, how long-term and sustainable investments in general take place, and whether and to what extent institutional investors take these ESG uh, indicators into account when they make their investment decisions. And if not, what are the barriers to do so, or are there best practices? I think this is a very important question for the uh, discussion later on. 
We have not finished our assessments, so I have to be careful what I say, but uh, as we are among friends, I'm sure you're not going to use this against me. I would like to share this a bit with you. I know there's press, but please don't uh, huh, be careful. Uh, but the message is, the overall message, message is not so surprising, so I can tell you. Short-termism in the capital markets is still there. So despite everything that happened in 2008, despite all the lessons and instruments we developed, it is still there, and it is seen as a big issue. I, I quote a little bit the replies. Uh, it's, it's not our final decision, but or conclusion. It is still there, the short-termism, and how can we address this? And, and as you heard before, in the shareholder rights directive, we try to develop some tools to, to do something against this. And it has to do with all the different players in the investment chain that sometimes pursue their own short-term interests um, and, and, and not the long-term interest or the sustainable outlook that we would like to pursue. There is this famous report from John Kay. Uh, I think it's still simply very, very good reading on the lack of alignment of incentives. <coughs> Second thing I picked up, and we hear this already a lot, beyond this consultation, there is still um, unclarity or uncertainty about fiduciary duties. We hear this a lot, um, and it would be nice to hear also your views. Is this a pretext not to take ESG issues into account? Or is it true that the fiduciary duty forces you to go for an optimal um, rendement, uh, profitability, and, and ignore um, uh, most of these ESG indicators? The question I ask myself now is, of course, when we have finished this consultation and the world is going on, what will we do next? Uh, and I think it's fair to say that in the Commission there is a high level of awareness that we cannot and we should not do everything. We cannot regulate everything. And you know that, but I still want to say it. Many things have to be done at national level. And, and there's also a number of things that should be taken care of by the normal market uh, forces. Um, although I would love to have this directive, you know, that I'm going to prescribe everything, but I don't think this is realistic. So it was a joke. Huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, there are a few ideas I have. Um, First is this issue about fiduciary duty, um, to, to maybe see whether we cannot clarify that ESG issues are part of your fiduciary duty. This is also discussed in the IORP, the IORP uh, Directive for Pension Funds, um, and the European Parliament is super interested in that, very positive. <coughs> Second is, is there an additional need or a possibility uh, to address more explicitly potential conflicts of interests in the chain, and if so, how? <coughs> and, and a third thing I, I picked up, and it's also discussed in the Financial Times, so it's not that new, is there enough diversity uh, and is there enough ESG experience in the organizations that invest our money? That are the big asset managers, the investment industry as a whole. Is there enough, uh, you know, diverse thinking and, and also in the top of these organizations, is there diversity? Uh, and, and the last one is transparency. Transparency code word in, in Brussels. We try to do a lot. The whole shareholder rights directive is a bundle of transparency requirements. <coughs> transparency is very powerful. Still, you can always go further, do more. And what would that then be? Maybe I stop here, Joe. <laughs>